what I'm going to focus on today is um, a project that we're just now getting our teeth sunk into. So at the end of last year, I won uh, a discovery grant from the Australian Research Council to study cultural astronomy in the Torres Strait. So we've got the Australia here in Papua New Guinea above us, the Torres Strait, a little group of islands between the tip of Cape York Peninsula and Papua New Guinea, which we'll kind of zoom into now, divided into five major island groups, um, each of the different geological formations. In general, they're divided between the western islands, which consists of the, the northern, the western, and the southwestern islands, and the central islands. The eastern islands are, are a bit distinct. There are two major languages in the Torres Strait, Mary and Mir, which is the eastern languages, the eastern islands, that's more closely related to the Papuan languages, whereas the others are Kalo Yagola and Kalo Wagala, different, slightly different dialects of that language. Those are more closely related to the Australian Aboriginal languages. Uh, one of the things to remember about the Torres Strait is during the last ice age, prior to about 8,000 years ago, that was a land bridge between New Guinea and Cape Verde Peninsula. It was also a land bridge that connected Tasmania with the mainland of Australia, a giant land mass that we call Sahu. So the islands are actually fairly recent in the grand scheme of things when you look at Australia as a whole. Much of what we know about early islander culture come from the ethnographic records of the Haddon Expedition in the late 19th century, and that focused predominantly on the Mare Island group, Murray Island, Duar, and Ware, down at the bottom two. Murray Island has a population of a few hundred people. These are the very tip of uh, the Great Barrier Reef, they're volcanic islands, and unlike the western islands, where it tends to be very shallow seas, these are very deep seas. This drops off to a few hundred meters just outside of the reef there. The cultures are old, but the people are ancestors of much older people. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how, during the course of the research, how old some of these traditions are and how they vary across the islands. Now to give you some context about Torres Strait Islander culture, the best thing to do is to go to the flag. The green on the flag represents the islands, the land. The blue represents the ocean, they were a seafaring people. The black bars represent the people who live between the sea and the land. The strange looking arc shape in the middle, that white thing, is called a jerry, a ceremonial headdress. It was actually worn by the warriors, now it's used more in ceremony. And the star represents two things. The five points represent the five major island groups of the Torres Strait, and the star itself represents a navigational star. The color white, a symbol of peace, represents what they refer to as the coming of the light, or the coming of the Christian missionary. It's very much altered a lot of the uh, islander culture, but they still maintain very strong traditional pre-colonial uh, ways. The book Stars of Tagai was actually written by Nani Sharp in 1993. This is sort of a treatise on islander culture. Um, it gives you an idea about the importance of astronomy and stars within islander culture. Now the book itself is about the islander people. It's not focused on astronomy itself. But it uses the story of Tagai, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and describes how that's a centerpiece of islander culture. When I was looking at what project I wanted to write a grant for in Australia, I was very drawn to the islands because it seemed that the culture was entirely based on astronomy. It wasn't a component, it was completely engrossed in astronomy itself. When I saw the book Stars of Taga, I thought, damn, that's the best title for a book on Islander astronomy. But it actually doesn't talk much about anything relating to do with uh, planets, the Milky Way, the Magellanic Clouds, the Sun, the Moon. It gives some information about calendars and how they relate to Tagai, but that's really about it. Turns out the first and last treatise written on Torres Strait Islander astronomy was published in 1907 by Rivers, who was one of the uh, people on the Haddon expedition from Cambridge. So there's quite a bit that hasn't been recorded. On Thursday Island, which is probably the most populous island in Torres Strait, there's the Gap Tatui Cultural Center. We wanted to see if they had any artifacts or anything related to astronomy. We went inside and found out that Gag Tatui means Journey of the Stars, and that about 70% of their collection was astronomy. It really just blew us away. In fact, in Torres Strait Islander culture, they have a special name 
for the people that, who were the astronomers. They were the, the primary knowledge holders. Uh, Zukabu Mabiyag is actually in the Kali Yagala language. Um, this is very modern art pieces. Uh, the title of my talk originally, which is in the abstracts, was Ancient Yet Modern. I did this to emphasize that even though these are ancient people who have been there for thousands of years, their culture is still strong, they haven't been relegated to the distant past, they continue the traditions now, and everybody has this knowledge. So to understand Torres Strait Islander people, you have to understand the story of Tagai. The story of Tagai was that he was a great warrior, an expert fisherman. They went, he went on a fishing expedition with 12 crew, they called Zugables, uh, 12 men, and as they went on the reef, they went fishing, didn't have any luck, so Tagai decided to go out on the reef to find a place where they could uh, maybe get a, some better fishing. They had their water kept in these containers on the boat. Well, the, the Zugables drank all their water, and during the day, as time progressed, they decided to drink Tagai's water as well, breaking a sacred taboo. When Tage came back, he was very upset and decided to kill all 12 of the Zugables. There are variations of the story, and some he tied the group, the men up into two groups of six and tossed them into the ocean where they drowned, and then one into the sky. One group, the Usio, became the stars of the Pleiades. Another group, Utimal, became the stars that we see in the belt and scabbard of Orion, or as they call in Australia, the asterism they refer to as the saucepan. And he himself went up into the opposite side of the sky. He is an enormous constellation. You can see here, this is the Southern Cross. This is left hand holding a spear. His right hand is Corvus the Crow, holding uh, sort of a red flowery fruit, an apple. His body goes all the way down. He's standing on top of his canoe, which is traced out by the stars in Scorpius. Now this might sound familiar to those in here, probably everybody, who are familiar with the story of Orion and Scorpius. He went to the opposite side of the sky to get away from the Zubabal. So it's reminiscent of Orion and Scorpius being put on the opposite sides of the sky as well. The story of Tagai is important for the Islander people. It, uh, it's, it denotes them as being seafaring people who share a common way of life. The stars of Tagai are the custodians of the knowledge and spirituality for the current Islanders and future generations. It gives them an order of the world, so it encompasses all of their laws and their customs, their world traditions. They're all instructed by a Tagai. Now what I'm giving you, obviously, is the, the, the kindergarten, preschool version of the Tagai story. It's much deeper than that. And the cycle of life is a period of time and renewal based on the rising and setting of particular stars. Their entire culture is based on astronomy. Okay, so when you get the Palagra rising of the Pleiades, that tells the people that they've got about a month and a half or two months before the kooky or the wet season comes and they can plant crops. So the different islands had different ways of, of gathering food. Some were more based on fishing, some had agriculture. The central islands are very small. They focus more on trade with the eastern and the western islands. But there is some causality in how some of the stories were interpreted. So later on, just, just as the wet season is starting to begin, you see the Pleiades setting at, at uh, dusk. It's actually believed when the Pleiades hit the water of the ocean, that actually splashes water up to create the monsoon season that's about to arrive. But what I want to talk about is, is one other constellation. Uh, this is something I got a bit of personal experience with. In Aboriginal cultures, connect the dots constellations are incredibly rare. Usually it's a particular star or an object or cluster of stars that represents a character and story. Whereas in Torres Strait Islander culture, they're quite common. Baidum is a shark. It's a generic term for shark. It doesn't refer to any specific shark. This is actually traced out by this lovely constellation, the Big Dipper, part of Ursa Major. When the shark, when it's parallel over Papua New Guinea, that's special significance, but just after sunset, when the nose of the shark touches the water, that signifies the shark breeding season has begun. Now, for those of you who don't know, when the sharks are breeding, that's the time you want to stay out of the water. It's very dangerous. And I wanted to show you this little video when I got to Murray Island. Uh, Professor Michael and I went down to the water, and just after, just at sunset, and in ankle deep water, this is what we saw. 
There he is. Hey, I better not get too close to that water. based on astronomy, where they use some of these dance machines we'll talk about in a second. This is a dance in the song about the Southern Cross. being extended. As part of the giving back process, um, we're looking at different types of tools and things we can develop for the students predominantly. Because when it comes to communities, they, they want the knowledge back in the books and the articles, of course, but their main focus is the future generations. They want to ensure that the kids are learning this stuff. And they're happy for the Western science and the indigenous science to both be taught. So this is a little video of some stuff they're doing on Bali and Magyag Islands in the, uh, the Western Islands. Look there, that's Orion. That's the same one I we talked about there with them three stars. That's Orion there. Yeah, the same population Everybody I've drawn the border. Them and then the Pazral, with them crew, the Tagai, with them started, them group. The program that they had on the iPads uh, last night um, I've never seen anything like it. The kids were excited, they love this kind of thing. So one of the tools we're going to be developing is, is the same thing a lot of you guys are going to be doing in your respective uh, areas, is putting the stuff in the still area, into the night sky, putting this information in there so that the kids will be able to learn from it. This is from one of the elders in the Western Islands, John Walk, who gave a talk on Islander astronomy at, at IAXIS in Canberra about five years ago. He's leading a project on those, those Western Islands. For indigenous people and non-indigenous people to come together, I see this as practical reconciliation of coming together, of understanding worldviews. We have appreciated over time the Western worldviews and paradigms. In our stories, like in the Carol Reg stories, you see them, you can plainly see them, that those stories are from the paradigms or the worldviews of indigenous people. Let us yarn these stories. They're good for us. I certainly enjoy them. And the important audience were the children. So a lot of the work that we're focusing on essentially is not looking at indigenous knowledge, Western science, opposite the spectrum. 
It's about moving forward. It's about getting students involved in science and indigenous knowledge and showing that uh, there are two very important, very useful ways of looking at the natural world. If anybody has a QR code, that takes you to uh, our indigenous astronomy blog, and it's good. Thank you.